Hello. Do se me rivaso la ti. <laughs> Do a deer, a female yeah. deer. Okay, good. Ray. We gotta get James out there too. Sun. Yeah, okay. Do a deer, yeah, he is. a female deer. I love already sing okay, that one. Bye. I don't know the rest of that song because I forgot. I haven't seen it in years. We should rewatch it and make clothes out of curtains. Ta da! <laughs> Darling, left goes on left, right goes on right, and you should never leave your coffee just sitting there like that. <laughs> woo woo! Uh oh, she's in love. <laughs> she was like, mm-hmm. reunited in a field. Nicole so has good. fallen in love hey. with the nutty. You're listening to 187 like Digital 4, the radio. The w- 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 I'm radio. Here, in a, okay. here we go. Happy Yahweh! Aloha! Welcome to BearsWave.com podcast. Coming to you live from my surf shack on the 25th floor of above Waikiki Beach. And we're here in Waikiki and we have our our hostess, Naomi Fan. Hey guys, what's up? And we've got our special guest, Simon Finn from Australia. Good afternoon, I should say. This Welcome point. to the podcast. <laughs> Good day, and you might. His voice makes the rest of us sound like Mickey Mouse, basically. And we're, <laughs> and we're brought to you by two sur- two sponsors. Do you want to throw out Surf News Network, Fawn? Yeah, we're brought to you by Surf News Network. And if you haven't checked it out, I don't know what you're thinking. You can if go any place in the world and see what's going on surf-wise, see what swells are coming at you. You can also go online and check out all their cool articles and get the latest and greatest. And sometimes there's some interesting things that come up on there that, you know, you, you never really thought about before and you need to take the time to sit down and really hash it out. You want to see our view, there's, we have a webcam in our window, the Waikiki webcam on surfnewsnetwork.com. So everybody in, what country are we shouting out today? We did Estonia, we did Des Moines, Iowa. We always bug, we always talk about the Australians here, but we got to come up with another, co- Nigeria. Shout out to Nigeria. If you're in Nigeria or Angola or where? Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea. We like your coffee. Or as they say here in Hawaii, Papua New Guinea pig. We, you can look at our webcam on surfnewsnetwork.com and check out how the surf is. How's the surf today, Simon? The surf has been glorious today. Came right no to compli- us. It was absolutely lovely. No complaints whatsoever. How much did that cost, that wave magnet on your board? I would say about forty nine ninety five. You know what? Those Aussies will not share with us where they got their wave magnet. But the waves came right at Simon and Nicole from Australia, the tandem teams today during the Duke Ocean Fest. And we got to do a shout out for Onnit.com. Our, oh, man. Onnit.com, O-N-N-I-T.com, the makers of Alpha Brain and Shoe Tech Sport and Shoe Tech Immune. Go check it out. And uh, if you type in the code name Bears, Bears Wave, you'll get, uh, what is it? 10% discount. 10, 10% discount. That's on every, right. On almost, on almost everything, except for kettlebells and battle, and battle ropes. ropes. Yeah. I just want to say I haven't taken my alpha brain today, so don't hold it against me. Oh, let's me. get some my, alpha brain. No, let's go get some alpha oh brain right God. now. I, I have some in my house, and I totally forgot but you to know take what? them. You know what? Bears always got alpha brain. Cause yeah, you know why you forgot to take them so was because you didn't take them, so you forgot. Exactly. That yeah. totally makes sense. Alpha brain is great. It's, it's uh, nootropics. It's vitamins for the mind. And as you can tell... We were brilliant. I mean, could we be <laughs> any more brilliant? And then we have the Shroom Stack Tech Sports, which I love. When some days, some days I, I like, because I, I, I don't have that many of them. Sometimes I like to say them. So, like, some days I'll have them, like, on a day where I know I'm going to need it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And some, then, then I forget <laughs> to mm-hmm. take them. You mean your Shroom or your Alpha? Alpha. Yeah, I take it every morning with my black coffee and my bacon and eggs. But also the immune system. Oh, and I take the immune. Oh, my gosh. I was feeling a bit under the weather last week, and I took my I took my immune, which I normally take every day anyway. Right. But I had run out, and I, they came in, and I just knocked out the the cold that I had. So. Yeah, so, you know that's how we do. But anyways. That's it for commercials. I mean, come on, we got to give a shout out to our sponsors. But let's back up the train. Beep 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 beep. Today was bearwaves.com tandem expression session. Bearswave.com. Tandem expression session out yeah. in the water. 
at Queens at the okay. Duke's Ocean Fest. And I guess there was two teams out there that really shined. Simon and Nicole from Australia. And Fawn and, 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 her, and your friend Gabriella went out. And you caught a wave. I don't think we shined as much as we were just tumbling a lot in the way. All the photographers loved watching you guys. So taking They're like, check it out. Those girls are getting drilled out there. This mm-hmm. is awesome. But we got Simon and Nicole here. And we want to talk story about, um, you know, tandem surfing, how you guys got started in it. And we want to talk about Duke and what he means to you guys out in Australia. And uh, so you guys just had a major event for Duke. And you had Archie Kaleppa and those guys. Uh, who else came out? We did. If I can start from scratch, uh, Duke introduced surfing, or or we should say the element of Aloha to Australia in the summer of 1914, 1915. And since then, we've had this smattering of visitors from Hawaii over the years. Over over more recent years, um, we've had through tandem surfing, where Bear Bear came out um, some years ago, uh, we've had Brian Kailana and his partner, Kathy. Um, Tarada. Tarada, my apologies. Mm. Uh, we've had Kalani Vieira, um, Chuck Inman, of course, Tiffany Rabacal. Um, I know Archie Kalepa came mm-hmm. a number of years ago. So we've had people coming back and forth over the, probably the last two years. Um, Bruce Raymond, who um, for, for a number of years, probably 25 years, was the CEO of Quicksilver, was always very keen to get um, a lot of the Hawaiians out to try and explain the cultural differences and the similarities between the Australian surf culture and the Hawaiian surf culture. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess that's that's where we've had this association with mm-hmm. uh, with a number of Hawaiians coming to visit us on the northern beaches, and it's, it's a real thrill for us. We love it. But uh, I heard a vicious rumour that Duke Hanamoku surfed tandem on, what, an 8 foot 6? 18. Tell, tell, how long was it? It, the, the board is the board is recognised rightly or wrongly is probably one of the most valuable boards in the world. It's certainly the most valuable board in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1912, at the Stockholm Olympics, uh, Duke was well known as um, the fastest swimmer, and there was no two ways about it that he would have won the gold medal. Duke, being Duke, this this wonderful man, fell asleep um, before the semi-finals, and they wanted to hold the race without Duke and they said, you know, unfortunately he's fallen asleep. There was an Australian swimmer by the name of Cecil Healy, Cess Healy, who was the Australian champion, said, look, if I'm going to win, I want to win against the best and I'm not swimming. Yeah, I remember swimming. that story. Yeah. So they went and found Duke. They brought him back and, of course, as the legend has it, he won gold and Cess Healy, the Australian, won silver. And afterwards, Cess said, um, this is just a wonderful feat that you've been able to do. Could you please come and visit us in Australia? Regretfully, World War One had broken out at the time, and and Cess Healy lost his life in World War One. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, so it was wow. it was a rather incredible story, and and Duke came out, and over a period of about three months, he lived in Australia, and he toured the northern beaches. He toured a number of areas around Australia. This is pre planes, of course, pre anything. He had to get everywhere via rail, which took some time. And wherever he went, he fashioned a surfboard, as we'd like to say, fashioned a surfboard out of local wood. Um, we believe there is somewhere between six and eight. I think there's only four surviving. Uh, three are hidden away where people don't know. It. Well, we do know where they are, but they don't mm-hmm. end up to where they are. And probably the most noted one is the one at Freshwater Surf Lifesaving Club. It's eight foot ten. It weighs 80 pounds. It's 22 inches wide, has very blocky rails, and it has no fin. And the week before Christmas, when he... What's a, what's a rail? A rail is the Spread. edge of the board. Okay. Um, when we say blocky, it, it's imagine it's like the edge of a table, so it doesn't have any smooth edges. It's very, very difficult to surf. Um, Duke fashioned this board, found a young girl on the beach by the name of Isabel Latham, who was a 15-year-old, and took her out and, and taught her to tandem. What is, is there any? Abs- sorry, is there any fins on the board? None. No, it's just no, no it, fins. It, there's none whatsoever. So but I can't. I can't really. Do, do those edges work as you can turn? Does it help uh, it turn? From what I know, and I've only spoken to a couple of the older blokes who would probably be in their late sixties and early seventies now, they were they were never able to ride it. They couldn't stand up on it. So how wow. Duke was able to not alone just surf it. But tandem. But, but tandem is just yeah, that's yeah. Really cool. beyond us. And it's, <laughs> it's just a wonderful feat. And just on, on to that, when Archie and Brian uh, visited us in 2009, um, 
we had a small ceremony to recommend uh, to recognize they were there and as Archie and Duke were holding Archie and Duke Archie and Brian were holding Duke's board um, Bluey May is one of our older life members who's only recently passed away said look I don't think anyone's ever touched it any Hawaiian has touched it since Duke Wow. And just the reaction on Archie and Brian's face was unbelievable. So there's this wonderful lineage that is there that only the great watermen from Hawaii have touched this board. But you told me when Archie, he leaned into it and tell me, tell us, describe the moment. You've got to keep in mind that Australians are a rather cynical bunch. We, <laughs> we we're probably don't have the depth in spirituality and, and the understanding of of the history of, of surfing and aloha, of course, that the Hawaiians have and represent exceptionally well. But when Archie in particular was holding this board, he leaned into the board and was emotionally enwrapped by the experience and everyone stopped what they were doing. And they realised that this is one of the great watermen of our time, absolutely aware and cognizant of the moment that he was in. And it made an indelible impact on a huge amount of people that really didn't understand this connection of Duke to Hawaiians and in particular uh, Hawaiians of heritage going back many many years it was an awesome experience Wow! Yeah, Archie was one of our uh, Chic Hydro cast members for Fox Fuel TV's Clean Break and you know we pushed these guys out of airplanes and took them swimming with sharks and and we took them to Maui and we're meeting with Archie Klepper early in the morning, and I don't even know how he found time in his schedule to, to be in our show. And we went down to the beach, and he sat down on the rocks near his home, and he started talking story. You know, and that he's so powerful and so humble. And the guys were just phew, realized like last winter or the winter before last, he'd been held down for close to five minutes you know, surfing toe-in waves. And when he came up, his partner on the jet ski had been looking for him. You have to be careful, you can't be going. Normally what happens is the guy on the jet ski will wait for the guy's head to come up. Because it's, been ha it's happened where the jet ski hits the guy, right? Mm -hmm. So he's kind of looking carefully, trying to find where Archie is. And when Archie came up, his partner's weeping, thinking he had died. And Archie Klepp has been in a show with you before, you know, that show in Australia. You guys oh, yeah. know that show called Coxie's Big Break? <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, Did you ever show. see my father on that? Look, I, I must admit, since... Um, <laughs> it was one of the first episodes. That's uh, pretty old. We have, since we've been here in Hawaii, the wonderful thing is we're away from our, our business and our, our work demands, which, like any of us in, involved in something, can take a little bit of time. And we've had the opportunity to have a look at it, and it was it was a wonderful... Oh, awesome. A wonderful uh, brief. All the so tandem teams that came Yeah, they, they did a good job on that They show. did a very good the job. Coxie's yeah. great. And then today we had the honor of having kind of like your cousins over in New Zealand were in the water. Did you get to meet any of those? Uh, they're, they're filming a show. I forget the name of it, but did you get to meet uh, any uh, of We them? heard the accent. So yeah. the, the <laughs> Australians and the Kiwis... Um, uh, collectively, we're very good friends, but uh, no, naturally, across the ditch, we're we um, <laughs> rivals. We are rivals. I don't really see it that way. Do you want me to tell you how I see it? Please. I see that the Kiwis are rivals with the Aussies, but the Aussies are like, what? Who are these people? Who get that fly off my shoulder. <laughs> I don't know if that's quite accurate, but I know the Kiwis are super, super. Uh, it kind of reminds me of San Francisco and LA. San Francisco is very jealous of LA, and LA's like, who? San Francisco? Where's that? <laughs> I think something we should know about um, New Zealand is, is here is a country of only four million, four and a half million people. But what they achieve on the world stage is just significant. I know, there's, it's like they're, all of them are superstars. <laughs> their sporting heritage is wonderful. And, and they're sailing. That they're, they're tremendous in so many aquatic and activities. All black. And Kiwis. in rugby in particular. Is, it, is that what it is? Is that the All Blacks is rugby? The, or is the All football? Blacks, um, every every country has their their codes of football. Um, in New Zealand, there's only one code, and it is rugby. And they live mm. and die rugby, and the rugby. greatest honour is I played Apple. rugby. It's pretty sweet, man. It's a good game. I played it, like, you know, without tackling and stuff. But, like, it's so, it's like your mind is working ton times faster because you have to think about so many things. It's kind of like, I don't know, it's like, it's like football and and soccer put together, right? And, and you football, hold it in your football, hand. Football, you take a break every ten seconds. Yeah, yeah, and you can't like one of the rules that's really amazing about it is you can't go backwards, or no, you can't go forwards. You can only go backwards. 
So when you're tossing to someone, you have to literally go backwards to throw it to them. You can't like go oh, forward and throw it. No forward. And if passes. they're ahead of you, like it, if anyone's ahead of you, you can't throw towards them. You always have to throw behind you. So it's like this game where you're like, you know, yeah, two it's, steps, one, it's, two steps forward, one step. It's back. like backwards, mm-hmm. like soccer football put together. It's what it's like going backwards all the time. It's fun. But that team, that all blacks, right? That's the name of the rugby the, the team. All Black describes the first fifteen, the the A grade team representing the, the country. Team. Yeah. And you will find traditionally the All Blacks are represented by a significant population of Maori. And the Maori uh, as recognised by many genealogists is the most feared um, respectful uh, uh, of all the native heritage. Well when you think about Polynesians. Captain Cook when he was cruising around Polynesia he called Tahiti the Society Islands because they were so social. Yes. <laughs> All the women would swim out to the boat, you know, and uh, and in uh, t- Hawaiian, Hawaii, they were greeted here warmly before he was killed the next time. But he talked about the Maoris when they, because you know that Maori dance is so powerful, the shaka or the haka. The, the, I mean, the, the haka, haka is a, a, scared, it's scared. a welcome to ceremony. So it's you will, what? It's a welcome. Yes, but he didn't take it as that. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> when you read his writings, because the haka is a very like Correct. warrior type right. dance. Right. He's sticking their tongue out and everything. And, and uh, he, in his original t- uh, pen, when he wrote his uh, cap- captain's log, it was like that's a very warlike. Uh, well, what was the culture. haka made for? You know, like what was it? It was only made for like you just said, right? Well, for I, I, greeting someone. I, again, I know this is going out globally, and I'm respectfully, I'm an Australian, not a not a New Zealander. But uh, the the haka is a welcome. However, the way in which is delivered um, is an emotionally engaging moment for about thirty five to forty five seconds, mm-hmm. and traditionally it is the All Blacks that represent the haka on behalf of um, oh. all New Zealanders. Oh, oh wow. and it is it is wonderful. So. Um, uh, for those teams that do get to play the All Blacks, um, it is a moment of deep respect and also uh, understanding that you're in for a heck of a game. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you know, I've, I've been in New Zealand, I've seen the Maori do the haka, but you know, the UH Warriors do it. Our okay. football team is so has so many uh, Polynesians, yeah, and so they use that as representing the Polynesian uh, dance and, as you said, greeting. And it's really quite amazing when you're in the U of H stadium, there's 50,000 fans, and uh, the opposing team is walking in, and, and they're doing their hand slaps and everything and doing their little warm-ups, and then all of a sudden the whole team goes, Hur! and then they, well, what was that? And then all of a sudden they do this, this the, the haka, and it, it's the best part of the game, don't you think, Shane? Yeah, it is. It really is. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, I do, I do respect the, the Kiwis, too. I love them. We had a, I had a great experience over there. Um, and I think a uh, clean break is going to go, be going to New Zealand. I think, I thought it might be Tahiti. Fabulous. So now, so we kind of got diverted there a little bit. Yeah. But you're, but you're uh, so talk to us now, talk story with us about how you got involved in tandem surfing. Um, I, I guess if I go back some ways, um, I, I was studying in the US during 87 and 88. Mm-hmm. And during my spring break in between college, um, went out, came out here to Hawaii for my first time and went to Makaha, and I, I didn't know too much about Makaha other than um, after <laughs> hey being <guys>. there, <laughs> uh, you've got to understand that it's a, it not only a unique place, but it's a place that demands respect and deserves Absolutely. respect. Mm-hmm. But I was sitting on the beach in awe, and I didn't grab a board, and I didn't go out, and I just saw this couple doing tandem, and I didn't mm-hmm. realise at the time it was Brian Kailana and Kathy Tirada. Mm-hmm. And I thought, how cool is that? On the way out, I got a postcard at the airport, and it was Brian and Kathy. And I've had that postcard with me since 1988. And I, I got to a stage in my life through surfing and surf life saving, which is professional we're life gonna, We're going to talk about that too, about the whole culture of that in Australia. Where you sort of, you've, you've done most things that you want to do. I've been competent in a number of areas and I sort of got to a point by thinking, geez, what's next? And I'd always wanted to do it. And just through life circumstances, um, Nicole and I got to a point by saying, well, let's give this a go and we loved it from that moment and it's it is very much which you may well identify with there there's life before tandem and life after tandem (laughs) and life before tandem was a tremendously enjoyable pursuit and i had been able to travel the world surfing and had 
put myself in great situations riding a whole pile of number of boards but then when you're surfing in tandem you're sharing that stoke with somebody and you're giving yourself the opportunity to be part of a community that anyone can be part of but so few take the opportunity to be part of yeah that's a powerful statement yeah it is it isn't easy or everyone would do it but it's definitely worth the effort to, to learn because it's such an incredible experience and a lot, a lot more people could and should be doing it. What's going on in Australia? Do you, how many teams do you have over there now, do you think? We're not as progressed as we should be. And this is the real challenge I think we have with Tandem globally is that people make assumptions that it should be for really burly blokes mm -hmm. and really tiny girls. And that's not the emphasis mm -hmm. at all. It's yeah, for totally. It is for people of any pursuit, of any opportunity to surf together. Mm -hmm. The challenge in Australia, and I, I do think it is rather different to um, Hawaii and, and France and California and Florida, is the Australian blokes are rather testosterone laden creature who wants to go out. I don't out know if that's different from anywhere else in the <laughs> world. <laughs> who wants to go out and pursue waves for himself. It's right. not necessarily about sharing. So you don't get a huge amount that want to come out and do it. Every now and again, though, we'll have some bloke, and it generally is a highly competent surfer who's done everything that will come up quietly yeah. to Nicole and I and say, I'd like to give it a go. You know, do you know anyone that will give it a go? Mm -hmm. And at this mm -hmm. moment in time in Australia, we are having a real resurgence, which is awesome. But most of these guys that are getting into it are really young guys that That's have travelled to Hawaii and they get the click. Oh. They, they've seen the wonderful Hawaiian surfers who we've mentioned before, and they realize that it's the missing piece in the jigsaw, right. that if I really want to be part of this thing we call surfing, I've got to, I, I just can't continue to do it without learning tandem, learning stand-up, learning a liar, learning to be a competent body surfer, mm -hmm. learning about the ocean, learning above it and, and underneath it. Yeah, above well, it and underneath it, I love that. Well, it's really humbling too, you know, to like, uh, this week was my first week being lifted in tandem, because yeah. You know, dad taught then, me to be an independent woman and go out and surf for myself. Mm -hmm. But this week is really humbling to sort of let go and surrender and just totally let someone else sort of take the reins, so to say. Mm -hmm. That's a really humbling experience. And, you know, a lot of times in surf culture, we're taught it's about being the top dog. And there's something just really humbling and beautiful about, you know, kind of like relearning, you know. It's kind of like relearning about surfing a little bit for me as the woman getting lifted. But then today I was the person in the back paddling and you guys have like a whole nother realm of responsibility. The whole time I'm just like trying to protect yeah, my partner, you know, so cool, I'm man. like, are you okay? Hang on. Yeah, it's true. It's really humbling and it takes, takes a really, uh, you know, quality person to be able to step back and, and sort of relearn. Yeah. Yep. Well, I found I've taken out a lot of, a lot of very powerful women. And it's liberating for them when they get to trust mm -hmm. a man, you know, and relax and kind of give control, you know, away because it, it's like on any ship. There's, you, you know, when I'm when I'm sailing out here, and I'm on someone else's sailboat, they're the captain, and they say, "Draw on the line," and "Draw on the line." You know, I don't, I, you got to And so on the surfboard, especially initially, the woman has to be really um, tuned in to the man and, and listen and follow his his instructions. Over time, though, they become like one. And it's almost mm -hmm. instinctive with women. Can we bring Nicole in for a second? Promise, Nicole, because th that was a good segue. Because Fawn talking about oh, she's dying to talk. Yeah, yeah okay, she now absolutely loves we it. Said she we said we would. It. I had a tricky thing here. I made sure that there wasn't. There was only four chairs, so Nicole has to sit in Simon's lap. So sit in Simon's lap. So you're close to the microphone. Simon told me to do that. So let's hear about your experience and how you started tandem and Nicole. Um, I have never. Sur I'd never surfed before. I'd grown up on a lake. That was our, our country escape and our holiday escape. So this, the ocean was very new to me and um, I found myself living in Sydney in my sort of late 30s and really wanted to give surfing a go and met Simon and I saw that he had a big enough board. It was a 12-foot <laughs> long a, board. That's important. And I just said to him one day, please, can you take me out on the board and teach me how to surf? And? And, and he said, But did you okay. know Simon? very well at that yeah, time? Yeah, we'd, we'd done, we'd done um, what we call nippers together, which is um, where all the children join in. Um, it's a voluntary surf life. But you weren't setting. dating at the time? No, we were friends. So are we talking about Not tandem yet. love here? Uh, yeah. 
Yes. That's where this we went. Went to tandem. And they call it tandem love. <laughs> so how did that all? Tell us more. Simon so always thinks I fell in love with his surfboard. Uh, <laughs> There's some truth in that. That I have fallen in love with all his surfboards. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we went out for our first um, surf lesson, which was a lot of fun. And um, he said, just stay lying down the front of the board until I tell you to stand up, okay? In fact, maybe don't stand up the and first time. And you hadn't time. done any tandem surfing yet, Simon? No, no. It Man, was, this it is was great. Rather so serendip together. It was serendipitous for us, if if I can sort of use that analogy. It's a great word. Yeah. Um, in surf lifesaving, it is a huge movement in Australia, and I'd, um, I was really enjoying it, but I'd sort of done everything I wanted to do, and y you compete at a, a local level, a state level, a national level, and then a, a world level, and I'd, I'd had great luck, and I'd had some great success, and thought, this is great, but I want to do something different. Nicole and I were both single, um, we both had children, and we were involved in Nippers, and I was coaching a young bunch, and of course, it's not hard to notice Nicole, and when she came up and said, would I'd like to have a surf. Well, I, I'd only just got this 12-foot um, Mickey Mignoz board, which is wow. what most, nice. of us know, most of us learnt on. Um, and a friend in Australia, um, Barry Bennett Surfboards, it's the oldest Australian um, family-owned surfboard company. I did some work for them, and Greg Bennett said, look, no one else is going to ride this board. Why don't you take it? And within a week, um, Nicole had said, you know, can I go really? out and have a go? And I think on that day, um, we stood up together and... Before I knew it, Nicola jumped into the cradle. Really? And I said, what are you doing? And then she jumped <laughs> down and said, well, I thought that's what you're supposed to do. So that's, that's how it started. <laughs> she read Nicole. Yeah, but I had no idea. I grew up water skiing, and so I'd seen um, all those water skiing tricks, you know, where mm. girls will climb up on the water skiers' shoulders and they do the pyramids right. and things like right. that. So that would be the closest association I would have had to tandem surfing. I'd never seen tandem surfing. But I always wanted to learn that sort of skill in water skiing. And then when we were on a surfboard, that's very much sort of like a water ski in a way, just a big water ski. And I thought, yeah, maybe you can. Lift me onto your shoulders. I was always daring him to do things. And he was wanting to surf separately, you know, and respectfully. And I was like, no, 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 we've got to surf as one person. It's yeah. funny. Quite the woman funny. has that instinct right yeah. away. You know? Yeah. You, know, yeah. I, you know, I wasn't surfing. I had no idea how to surf. But I guess I had the balance. And that's maybe. probably the difficult <laughs> thing for the men. <laughs> yeah. Yes, when they're starting off with a female is that, to be successful in tandem, you have to become one. You've got to surf together. And it's not a sexual thing. It's just a, a recognition. It's the only way it's going to work. Right. And respectfully, the situation we were in, I, I wasn't uh, desperate to be holding Nicole so close, mm -hmm. but um, she didn't yes, know she what she was doing. So <laughs> we, uh, we ended up being that way. But um, yeah. it, that, that, is. that was quite some time ago. And since then, um, it's, it's when was that? full story. When, how, how long ago was that? Um, 2005, 2006. So wow, sometime. Yeah, I remember. Well, I was I used to train in a lot in martial arts, and in that environment, there's closeness. Whether it might be a guy, it might be a girl, but there's that physical physic physicality of being close. Although you're beating each other up, a bit different. But <laughs> I was used to um, having to be a little bit more delicate with my, with my uh, female partners, you know. But they would always say, "No, you, you got to be." you know you got to be strong you got to be powerful and people that I teach out in the water I've learned that the girls really want the guy to take charge when the girls are first learning when they surf with someone where the guy will take charge they feel really comfortable and when the guy is like kind of soft with his you know he, he wants to turn her but he's being delicate or not let not really communicating clearly what he wants it, the, it, it, it just doesn't quite sync up all the time so it's so it's kind of a um, learning experience yeah but you have to be close i like you have to be like one person mm. now you guys are kind of known for this one p there's a picture of you guys riding this really big wave can you describe that moment i want to hear i want to hear no nicole i want to hear you i want to hear simon I think and the you best way to describe it back me and forth i want to hear about it i was um probably very naive but i trusted <laughs> him o like 110 percent yeah that's that's mm. it that's what it's all about more than 100 percent for, yeah. me, for me to go out in those massive waves. But wait a minute, talk about this. You're, you're, you're arriving at the beach top from the beginning. But what, what beach was it? To, that, we want to hear that whole story that day. Um, for, for Australia, um, if we look at a lot of Californians, um, Mexico is their next door. It's their sojourn. Mm -hmm. For Australians, it is Indonesia. 
and Bali is ah. that jumping off spot. So many of us have been going back and forth to um, Bali, but Indonesia further, which is Samba, Sambawa, Java, um, Timor, the wow. Mentawis, all, all those kind of islands. So for us, it's not too unusual. However, um, well, I'd, I'd probably surf as bigger waves, but that day where that photo was taken, um, it jacked up really, really quickly. But what wasn't seen is that we went out in the water with um, someone we know very, very well who ex- lives in Bali and is an exceptional surf, and we just sat by Mick, and it took us a little while. But um, it's You know what? What you just said, it took you a little while before you dropped? Um, is that what you just... Yeah, that was, we, and that, I, that shows yeah. me, tells me everything about you, Simon. That's so important. That you didn't... You went out there, you waited, you were careful. Sometimes you can wait an hour when it's a little bit big. That tells me a lot about you, that you were being very careful, very selective. I'd like to say that, but we were pretty keen to come in because it was getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, and yeah you waited You're patiently, like, wait, getting bigger. No, let's we waited and then it was jacking up and the tide drops and, and uh, we're talking about the Bukit Peninsula where you've got um, Uluwatu, Padang Padang, uh, impossibles and then going around to the other ways. Impossibles wow. is a, a lovely freight train, but when it's dead low tide and really, really big, it's it's m- m- fantastic and it can hold to, I don't know, three times overhead reasonably easy. But you've got to get in really, you've got to get in early and you've got to stay out in front of the wave. And that wave we got, um, we have respectfully got bigger waves and nicer waves, but that was probably the first one and it was just breaking over our head when that photo was taken. And we had these little side fins made for the board, and I can just remember we was we were going so fast that they were humming, and and I didn't know if it was us screaming or what it was, but it was the hum from the fins, just yeah. this high pitched buzz, and it wow. was awesome, it was wonderful. But let me let's start out now. Let's get to see. He's talking about it like a um, like academically looking at it. I want to hear about <laughs> the emotional content. You get down to the beach. And uh, is it a wetsuit day? And it, you know, no, you know, it's 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 a it's warm water. It's a, cl- but, a cliff. But are you living? Are you li- are you at the beach? Do you see the bu- surf building up over the, a few days? Or what's the emotional content when you're looking out at these waves? Are you at, are you driving to the beach and all of a sudden you see this that it's gotten really big? We had accommodation on the cliff. So you were looking. You were watching break, it build, and okay. we did see it. We did see it. Yeah, this beautiful, um, big. Yeah, set of waves just continue. They're like machine. Were you hearing it overnight building or? Oh, we had followed the chart. We knew it was going to occur. Oh. So okay. we'd, we'd surfed a bit and then um, um, I'm quite keen on measuring and timing. So I right. timed the sets for about an hour beforehand and I realized we had a, a window of opportunity to go out. Mm-hmm. And then when you're out there, you, you timing. timed it. That's awesome. Yeah, just, you got just all technical on your it. stopwatch. That's well, how you do it. If you get caught in the middle, then you are in trouble because mm-hmm. um, you, you're taking, um, you know, th- tw- well, for us, 12 to 15 foot waves on the head and you can only stay underwater so long. So, right. and especially for Nicole, I'm thinking, well, how is she going to cope right, with that? Right. So you've got a little window of opportunity to, to get out there, get the waves and get in. So we had seen it for a while and um, a lot of people down the bucket will um, stay in a little Wurrung, a little tiny little villa without mm-hmm. power and without hot water just cold running water and you can watch and observe everything 24 hours a day wow so nicole what were you feeling when you went to paddle out um I, a mixture of nerves and um, excitement mm-hmm. the wave was clean so th- that's what made mm-hmm. me sort of it gave me confidence but how so. hard was it to paddle out um paddling out was okay but paddling onto the wave was a challenge um, tell us well, you have to paddle really hard and you get to the point where um, when you're paddling onto the wave, the front of the board is sort of hanging <laughs> and I was paddling air in mid-air and so I was like, paddle, paddle, paddle. And I'm like, well, well, I am, but there's no water underneath me. It's like oh, a sheer wow, drop. Oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, but luckily, yeah, you're a pretty strong paddler. So, yeah, about the third attempt, I think, finally the nose, mm. yeah, dropped mm. and we just went down really fast and stood as quickly as we could and then Simon yeah just had like this vice like grip around my waist yeah so could you hear the wave at all like crashing behind you <laughs> yes what was it like, like I didn't look behind just, me yeah. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> but once we were back. surfing on the wave I was totally happy and right. no nerves whatsoever what what uh, lift did you guys uh, we managed a little swan 
No, nice. yeah. no, no, it was survival up until <laughs> yeah. up until the end, and then I think it was a, a very quick swan. But you've got to quickly yeah. flick out of the wave because it it dumps on what we call greedies, which is just bare reef. So that's no good. And explain no, explain to the audience what is a swan. What does it look like? It's probably the most. I wouldn't say the most traditional of tandem lists, but it, it is the most graceful. Is that fair to say? Beautiful. Beautiful, yes. It's a, a holding um, the woman on your left or right shoulder in a, um, imagine a Rolls Royce um, <laughs> swan, uh, the flying lady as such. I think that's probably the best. In yoga, they call it fish pose. That's what you're doing. And the woman's Cheer. basically doing that's fish right. pose. That's right. Describe yoga. it fun. Yeah. So you're just sort of kicking your legs behind you with your um, hands either to the back or to the side, and you're holding your legs back straight and putting your toes together and just and sort of arching. arching. It's, it's yeah. a fish pose. Yeah. yeah it's and true, though, that that is a beautiful one. And, you know, there is ones that are harder, but they're not as beautiful, you know? Like really, really hard ones you can get a lot of points on. But, you know, they're not as beautiful. You know, it's just standing up. <laughs> like when you put someone's hands, what's that one called? Where the, the woman uh, stands on your hands and you just... The hand to foot? <laughs> yeah, it's just so... <laughs> you're just standing. Like, it's cool. It's, it's, it's showing really how cool, hard, strong you are. But it's not beautiful. But it's not, you know, as graceful and beautiful as the swan. No, absolutely. Yeah. What's the biggest wave you guys have ridden? Uh, what's your favorite, you, you know, in a, in a, when you've been able to drop it and hit your left right away? Tell me about that wave. Um... Probably locally, um, we live um, in an area of Sydney called Manly Freshwater, which is our little area. Mm-hmm. Um, and at Manly, there's a wave called the Bower or Fairy Bower, either mm-hmm. one. And when it's a, um, a high tide and it can hold a, a quite a, a easily overhead, double overhead, um, at high tide it's reasonably easy, and we like to surf that. You know, in a one arm back and just hold it as long you as you love we can. a one arm wow, back, don't you? Cool. We do. It's I a think great it, lift. You guys are really good at it. It's a wonderful lift. Ex- um, explain what that is. Um, you're asking for a lot of descriptives. Speaker. It's difficult. This can I describe it? It's, Please do. It's, it's, it's I, I, because I'm a writer. I've had to describe these things. I know it's very difficult to describe. It, the, the man grabs uh, the the woman and man are surfing. He puts his right hand, for example, in the small of her back. She brings her left ankle up a little bit. He grabs the ankle. Uh, they do down up and she jumps as high as she can up into the air and then arches backwards s- over his hand and uh, and then her hands arch back and her knee is in kind of a stagged or pike position and it's it's a quick you can do that almost before you do your bottom turn and you can surf in it so well and you can uh, and it, I think it's the most beautiful of all lifts the one arm back so then you, so you so that's the now now I want to ask you this question describe for us I think Shane's zooming in on Freshwater Th- this is the most <laughs> surreal freshwater freshwater Australia. Australia right now. It's a real thing. Un- unfortunately, as much as I would desperately love oh, to have these there. skills, we're looking at the Google. Ta- hey, Shane, explain to, explain to us what you're doing. This is freshwater Australia. Well, wow. this yeah, is but, but actually what we the stretch of Manly but, is three beaches in one. But what are you doing, Shane? What are you looking at? I'm at Street View right now. On what? Google on, Earth. On Google, Google Earth, Earth Street View. You know, Shane and I do this a lot. Like I'm, I'll be walking like in some part of. You like guys surf where? That one's That's the spot. You guys yeah. can totally point Google break, it of too. course. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. spot. Point it's break beach. into a bay. So that looks like an outrigger canoe sitting right there. Bay. Well, what this photo, what we're looking now, at Google Earth is um, Freshwater Beach, which is our home beach. This is where Duke introduced. Um, wow, cool. Surfing is This such. is it. Freshwater and Beach. It's a small little beach on the northern beaches, but what you're seeing there is it's a great the, venue. The Australia Day Carnival, which is uh, the longest running surf or surf life saving. When are we coming for that? Uh, well, it's held Australia Day every year. Oh, it's it's been going yeah. since 1908. And when is Australia Day? What year? Uh, that's what January 26th. Yeah, we need to start <laughs> going to that. That is a beautiful venue. <laughs> it, it done is a, and done. Wow. You know what I love amazing. about that venue is people can see. What's being done right from the cliffs and, and stuff? It's it's wonderful, and that's one of the great things about the northern beaches of Sydney. If we can advocate that, I've for always heard about him, him, him to Sydney, surfing and people out. looking down from the cliffs to watch him surf. You I've can, always heard about that. You can do that pretty much anywhere. So, um, w- w- yes, I probably like um, freshwater and manly are our favourite breaks. Let's hear about your worst wipeout. Um, and surfing wipeout would probably come back to um, impossibles again 
Our this would have been... It, it is regretfully aptly named because sooner or later it's going to catch up with you and it's an impossible <laughs> way to master. Uh, probably three years ago, I, not so Nicole, probably wanted to push it a little bit further than we should have and um, Steve Bainey was very kind to have a wonderful gun made for us. So it's, we've got a, a tandem gun, a 12-foot pintail tandem gun. Wow. And it, we were surfing as, as big as we caught big as we could and it just got glassier and glassier and more perfect and then just on that last one of the day Nicole took a tumble it's like tumbling down concrete so she just got massively bruised and Mm. then I had to find her and that was a little bit hairy so it was a matter of quickly grabbing her and then getting out of the water and let's hear Nicole's version of it (laughs) come on we always have the wipeout segment we let's hear your wipeout your side of the story (laughs) It's the, one, it's the one where you're underwater for so long you're not sure which way is up and yeah. you're thinking, oh my gosh, my lungs are going to burst and where's the air? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you guys get right back up and go out again or what was your... Um, no, that was it. I think that, that was, was pretty it. much it that time, yeah. But Sometimes you reconnected you never with know. Simon right away and yeah, the fine. leash didn't snap at least. It's not as, it wasn't as bad as, yeah. 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 We've never snapped a, a, a lead or a, a, a leg rope as such, a leggy as we call them. Uh, however, I'm going to start calling them a leggy. A leggy. leggy. But normally we have um, leggies custom made, so they're 10 foot ocean and earth leg ropes. But on that trip, I remember we came home with a 16 foot one. So Because it stretched out so far. Yeah. It was a yeah, 10 foot leash. Ten, they're 10 foot, we get 10 foot standards. To 16. 16. They've never snapped, so. Yeah, that's nice. Do you double points. plug your boards? It, we do, actually. Yeah, yeah. it's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Wow, that's something else. Wow. It's pretty incredible, the responsibility that you know the guy has to make sure that their partner is safe. I know I already said that, but yeah, today, taking being that person today, I'm like, oh my gosh. You've had an unusual experience yeah. being a tandem girl in the front and the back of the board. Yeah. Which I guess is something, I'm, if we are talking about tandem, one thing I think I am keen to talk about and debate or argue if one can put forward it, proposal is that tandem needs to acknowledge i think globally that we're many schools in one and if we continue down a path of purely competition then we're going to end up with four to five maybe six teams that can perform at a level where they are competitive amongst one another what we need to recognize is that we're a very big school of thought we're a um a a, uh, in political terms a church of understanding a church of common thought process where we need to recognise that tandem uh, should be available to all and sundry, yeah. regardless of their pursuit. Yet, when we do come together, we should recognise that competition and this pursuit of excellence, which needs to occur, mm-hmm. such are the ideals of Olympia and the likes, right. um, but only should be one element. There should be other social elements. So, well, I would love to see a tandem paddle race, a paddleboard race. Mm-hmm. We'd yeah. love to see a D&D, a dad and daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we would would love about, to see a. How about a bear and dog? We had our we had our dog tandem event about three years ago. Mm-hmm. Well, today we had the, the whole family out on. And the we had girls and girls, today. and we had three. Yeah, we had three four, little, four, three little girls. Who, three who all was girls. out there today? Three girls with Moses Pasquitz. Yeah. 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 girls were. <laughs> so I think we need to recognise that um, for us to make attractive tandem surfing to other people, that it shouldn't be. Let's turn up to the beach here you lifts the way you go because that will limit a certain demographic it will limit some men because they think i, I cannot lift a woman like that right. and it will well, it limits yeah it limits. will lift, limit other women thinking i know i'm not as light as this wonderfully athletic tiny little hawaiian girl i don't think i can do that what we need to get this point across is that no you can surf together and if you do no more than stand up and have a beaming smile then you've achieved more than 99.9% of the You're yeah, preaching to the choir, that's, brother. That's, no, yeah. that's so true because I've never done it before because I always thought, okay, I don't weigh 100 pounds, you know, I don't really know. And then crazy Todd Robertson came up to me and said, how come no one's ever lifting you? You're, you're pure muscle. You're strong. So he just threw me right up into a lift and he changed my whole life just you by recognizing that. You jumped into that, it, though, because yeah, you're well, strong. But yeah. yeah, it's, it's you know... It's got to be just like everything else. We, diversity is so key to everything that well, we do in excellence. Well, there's, yeah. Can I jump in on this too? Because <laughs> I agree with you so much. I think we have this great, uh, like you said, the Olympic path for our tandem teams. The competition has become, uh, there's there's a couple adjustments I'd like to see to the competition. One is I don't think that 
because the female partner is super flexible, that makes that that makes them super good. There's become this emphasis on female flexibility as opposed to athleticism. That's a different thing. So I'd like to see them balance that out a little bit and make more of an emphasis in the competition arena on actual athleticism. And I'd like for them not to lose the beauty part of the uh, tandem. But what we did today, what we've been doing in the last few years is with the expression sessions, we're opening up the door wide open and having fun. And it's going to develop along a path where there will be another arena uh, of an expression of beauty and an expression and then th th there's can be there can be a whole competition just on beauty if you wanted to have competition but I'm kind of like I don't want to do that I want to bring in the teams that a lot of the women that are not as small or not as flexible may be able to do more of those really beautiful poses too that maybe mm. maybe aren't so difficult in some respects as far as flexibility but they're so beautiful it, it's an important debate to have and I think it is an important um, not so much argument but a, a talking point as such to say yeah. what if if there is a collective group of people helping to steer this pursuit of tandem into the future mm -hmm. then what should it look like and I'd just like to throw the cards out there that we need essentially to maintain that desire to achieve our, our ab absolute optimal um, excellence which is what we displayed yesterday but at the same time, we need to recognise that we have wonderful individuals like Lance and Jackie who are respectfully are in their early 60s that are doing something mm -hmm. tremendously yeah. inspiring. And then we have um, Fawn and a mate going out and saying, bugger it, I'll give it a go. Mm -hmm. And then we have someone else saying, why don't we give it a go? What we need to recognise is that we can draw these people in and say, you know, welcome to the clan, welcome to the You know what's the, the coolest thing yeah. of all today? Yeah. During, and that's what the bearswave.com tandem expressions... Sorry about uh, yeah. the la ambulance guys. That that yeah, but that that's that's, that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is how it is. But th that's part of this Bears Wave Tandem Expression Sessions when I left uh, ITSA's board and was co-president is because I saw this tremendous need for this other this other track. But you know what was so cool today? Just as we were about to paddle in, uh, I think it was John Paul, I forget how you say his name, and a girl from Malibu he, that he grabbed off the beach, paddled out. Did you see that couple? Yeah, that was awesome. There was a new tandem team just showed up in the water out of nowhere. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, and that's what it's about because these these fun fest type events are kind of the gateway, I think, to people to go on to competition. But people are tired of showing up and spending 150 or 300 bucks in a contest and being eliminated in the first round. And, oh yeah. And yeah. and I still think that this this whole element of competition has become so over skewed on female flexibility as opposed to team athleticism that there needs to be a sort of a correction in that area too but in terms of uh, I, I love what you talked about about the paddle paddling together but today didn't we have a blast out there today for it, 90 minutes it was wonderful and that probably for um, Nicole and I we we did paddle in early um, because we we were stoked and I won't say I'm a massive proponent of, of all the great surfers in the past, but Nat Young um, did say something some years ago uh, after he had had his altercation and his home break in Yamba. Yeah, so I mean, and Nat said, you know, I don't have to surf as much any day, uh, surf as much these days to be stoked. And it's, respectfully, it's the case for me is that, um, you know, I, I get a little bit choosy now when I go out and I get as much through pushing someone into a wave in our home bait and break at freshwater there's probably a, a handful of people that go out and you know we, we can pretty much get what we want but i i have as much fun now getting to the beach and i can dump my board and think bugger it you know i'll just swim out there and push someone into a wave or go out and s paddle next to someone and say look, look let's get out of this area and move over here mm -hmm. and it's you never know the impact of having some engagement with somebody else when you you're at the beach a, a week later and you're walking down with, for us, it's a surf ski or a paddle board and someone comes up to you and says, thank you so much for that push last week or thank oh, you cool. for this. Well, and you've got no idea who they are. And that's well, what we should be trying and to do. And that's what Duke's Ocean Fest is all about. That's what Aloha is all about. And it's about, you know, not just being an excellent surfer in the water by doing so many great cutbacks or so many lifts, but having an excellence in your spirit and the way mm -hmm. that you approach people in the water. Because anyone can be a jerk in the water and still be a bad surfer, but it takes a lot of skills to have excellence of heart and yeah. also excellence of skills, you know? Yeah, and yes. just being able to pass that soaked onto someone else is really what being a surfer is all about to me. Well, we get it passed yeah, on to us. Cheaters suck. Well, when we, what is that? <laughs> Cheaters suck. 
when we were, when I, you know, I love surfing canoes, and a lot of people like frown at me, like, why do you like surf canoes? Because I see they get me stoked, the beginners out there. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite things to do is be paddling for a wave, and I see someone struggling for a wave, and so I catch it lying down, and I push them in, and they don't know they've been pushed into the wave. You know, and I'll just be around kind of pushing people. I feel like Santa Claus kind of, you know? Mm-hmm. And the other day I was tandem surfing with someone, and this girl's like, screaming yeah 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 she's looking over us. we're screaming for her. she goes that's my first wave i ever caught i from south africa my first wave i ever caught and then yesterday i was out surfing and naughty jenny's out there giving a, a surfing lesson and there's this girl her name was mary aloha mary if you listen to the podcast and he said uncle bear's going to take you tandem surfing and she goes what's that and we put her on the board and as we're paddling i mean so no beach practice as we're paddling out and there's no waves either, right? Mm-hmm. As we're paddling out, all of a sudden the wave of the day is coming in. And so I'm describing to her, you know, you're going to get up real quick, come back to me, jump as hard as you can in my arm, and then I'll tell you what to do next. Right. And we, t- we paddle out and did that thing where you turn as you're paddling out and dropped into this wave. And we got up and I'm pulling her up off the board, ah, muscling her up. And then she jumps in my arms and I say, look at me. And she looks at me and I say, now let go of me. And then I throw her into a swan. Now arch, put your arms back. And she did two of those lifts like that with me. And, you know, just hear my voice. I am probably more, I'm sure I'm more happy saying that than I've ever mm-hmm. been winning a contest. Well, you taught me how to surf just like that when I was a kid. You threw me into a wave and <laughs> <laughs> you did it to Jeremiah and Fawn, right? Yeah. And Josh, yeah. 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 You did it to all of us. But it was, it was great because you're really, like, you're really good at, at you know, protecting and showing the way to do it without getting, you know, totally But I remember shy. sitting on the beach, Shane, and watching you guys all out surfing and thinking, this is more fun than surfing. Mm. And I know what you mean now. I'll go out sometimes and I'm doing a 45-minute surf session. And I'm happy and I'm stoked and I got my oxygen, you know. But this, this, um, this argument... I like a talking point. Yes, talking point. Um, yeah. Sorry. Let's I'm bring it back. Let's bring it back. I have to come... Back normally. By to the way, you did a argument. great job yesterday during the ITSA contest, I, doing all your uh, uh, announcing. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, just I, had some, th- I just I had to throw good, a plug in there for you. Yeah, I got some good video of you yesterday. This this is very Simon cool. was yeah. killing it up but there. Can you let Eileen in? But the up? interesting thing is that not everyone, regardless of their age or experience, gets to this point of understanding that what is surfing about, and regardless of whoever they are, wherever they are in the world, I think that is that importance of coming to Hawaii and understanding what this thing called aloha actually means because it it is a throwaway line for some yet they don't know what it is in practice they don't know what it actually means and if I can go from the serious to the more no, flip stay with it we're okay. not what you're yeah, saying right well, there, right to the, the more, microphone's yours to the more enjoyable flipping it's the first time we met Brian Kailana and, and Kathy Trotter and some of these other wonderful um, representatives of Hawaiian people. And we're going tonight to see him and Archie are, Kalepa which inducted, inducted into the Water Hall Which we Hall are thing. immensely thrilled at. And, and Nicole and I are fortunate enough to be representing um, Freshwater Surf Lifesaving Club and the Mayor of Warringah, wow. uh, Mike Regan, if he's, if he's listening. Um, indeed, uh, Archie and Brian getting in is wonderful. But meeting um, Brian all those years ago when he came to... Um, Noosa for the Festival of Surfing and a lot of Australians hadn't seen Brian Kalan. Naturally they all know who he is. You know, it's it's like asking who the, uh, any well-known person is. It's, it's quite straightforward. And his most important thing there was to teach other people tandem. And Brian wasn't desperate to show us all the greatest lifts. He was desperate to make sure that we knew how to hold our partner. We knew how to take care of that partner and if we fell off what to do. And I thought this guy can be teaching me all these other things. Why is he spending so much time on this? But that's the spirit of aloha, Mm -hmm. is that let's get the basics right, let's understand the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. One of the great things is we ended up in a heat with Brian and Kathy, and Nicole and I are just keen as mustard. That's an Australian term to say you're quite excited. And we're out there and we're sitting out in the water and we're sitting right next to Brian and Kathy, and he'd say, this wave's yours. And we took the wave and we took the wave. I said that to Brian once and he didn't need it. Well... (laughs) <laughs> Brian and Kathy have done this five or six times now Nicole and I are exhausted you know we've been lifting all morning we, we paddle back out we're just sitting there and all of a sudden this great wave comes through the wave of the day and they take off and then at the end of the heat I went jeez you're pretty generous mate and he said nah a tired surfer's a tired surf's an advantage to me and I thought jeez that's not <laughs> what, what did he say what was, what well he was more than happy for us to just get tired and take everyone yeah, no, away you know what he said I've, I've had the same relationship with him I said I, I gave him a wave once and I'll take it and then what was the one time 
Queens is a tricky little break, you know. It's easy to to, to uh, drop in on someone because the peak, it's like a double peak. And I, I dropped in on Brian Keelan. I said, I'm sure sorry about that. And he goes, no, that's fine with me. You can do that any time because, of course, it eliminated me from the heat. <laughs> you do that any time in competition that you want, but not when we're out, out surfing together. So I think, we, you know, we, we should take... Um, the ethos and should take the responsibilities we have of surfers seriously mm -hmm. but we should never take ourselves so seriously and oh, and yeah. that does uh, frustrate well, me spoken. a little bit when you yeah. s you meet somebody who knows they are a champion or a bit of a legend in their own lunchbox but in the greater community really you know they're not mm -hmm. much more than a slice of bread well in Wait, terms of small family that. too yeah. you know well there's yeah and there is this thing where I really loved where you were going with this and I hope that we can keep working together to develop this other side. Eileen has just walked in. She's the woman who runs the the National Kidney Foundation event over in Florida, and we've talked about this a lot about developing this other area of tandem surfing that expresses the fun and the beauty as opposed to just the competition. Like you need both of those elements. Mm -hmm. But I think it was I, we you know we went from when we started the ITSA in 2006. I think we had about a dozen real teams. And then we developed 16 new teams here in Waikiki. And we had that first event, I think there was a total of 24 teams. So more people kind of started and came out. And the next year we had 32 teams at the Duke Ocean Fest. And overall that year there was a total of 60 teams that participated. And Eileen knows this, over the course of the next couple of years it began to slip. And that's when I said we need to have a different venue. Because these beautiful teams had stopped showing up because no one likes to be cannon fodder, you know. Mm -hmm. And 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 really, it wasn't. It isn't their fault that the box that we said they had to fit in, they didn't fit in. They, there's a different expression yeah. of tandem that's available. It may be that you want to do the beauty part of tandem, or maybe you just want to do the fun part of tandem, like what Fawn did today. And then he uh, he has the idea, Eileen, of doing. Um, they have the idea of doing tandem uh, distance paddling, you know, and. Uh, and who knows, you know, fa uh, father, daughter, or, or well, we, we, we had, nickname it D and D, dad and daughter. But we, but it doesn't. But we had uh, D and D we out here Candace, means Dungeons and Dragons. We had Can <laughs> we had Candice Appleby out there with uh, Vanina Walsh last year, and this year, um, you know, uh, Moses Paskowitz was out there with three little girls on a huge, big, my mm. huge, big Walden surfboard. And they're out. They're Why can't we do all that, you guys, and not well, take ourselves so seriously? I think like we you are. Said. I, no, I think we are moving in that direction, and. It, and whenever we get too far ahead of ourselves historically, we should always look a little bit, l little bit back into the past. You know, we we had World War Two because of the failures of World War One. We we had the Cuban Missile Crisis for the failures to address some um, other issues. But I'm going off on oh, a yeah, yeah, you tangent. Are. Yeah, but brother. Let, yeah. Let's just in the immediate tandem future, we've got you know two of the most wonderful um, bearers of the standard in tandem in Stephen Barry Bainey. And you spend a little bit of time with these guys, and they're in their 60s. And, and they just don't take it that seriously. They've achieved a huge amount. The biggest concern for them is, is sharing a laugh and a joke. Mm -hmm. And it is this wonderful spirit that when you're with them, they really don't give too much more of a hoot than seeing other people have fun. And I think if we can leave from this point on, no matter who does tandem, is that it is about allowing it to be attractive to others and it's not something that you own it's not something that you have a right to it's something that mm -hmm. you have a responsibility to say give it a go you're the steward you're the steward you're being given a gift by duke and by um all those legends before and stephen barry baney and we're just we have this gift and we shouldn't be stepping all over it but eileen knows eileen when we came to coco beach the first year did we have an uh, an official competition no we had a fun fest. And so what happened then is all those other teams, all those people there, it was hard. But we got some of the local people to want, oh, I'll try that. That looks like fun. And we even, we stirred up the interest enough because we did expression session, expression session. And we did a fun fest event the third day. But we got local teams. By the third day, they were out surfing in our special fun fest. And I think one of the mistakes that we made in Australia, if I may say so clearly, is that... Um, I think it's a big mistake to go to a new venue and show up with the best teams in the world and just shut down the local the local teams that are just beginning or and I can say it this way they're just learning to fit into the box that we created saying these are the lifts and this is how you do a competition and so you, it's, who want you know it's not right to go into someone's backyard or into their family room 
and just embarrass them because you've been doing this for a few years longer. I think it's much better if we go to and Brazil. And also, you know, when you go into a new area, they don't even know what the sport is. So right. like, you have to introduce it, you know, first. And get then, the get right. the interest, and then get them then get them to like it. So, but it's grown. It's grown since you know you've been to Australia. Uh, tandem surfing has grown a lot more, right? Yeah, but we want to go back to Australia with more of the Aloha approach. And go into Brazil with the Aloha pr- approach. We've been invited there. We want to go into Japan with the Aloha approach, and and what you talked about, fun. Let's go there and have fun, have a fun fest, do do expression sessions two or three times, and then all and, and then just like today, a new team just paddle out. They couldn't stand it. The guy grabbed the girl. He paddled out and joined with us, and and do that in Australia and do that in these other these other venues and revive. Uh, ta- we you know we revived Tandem in 2006, and now it's kind of faded a little bit and we need to bring it back to life I think and it's it is renewal it's any organization needs to go through renewal um, you have it with our clients you have it with family and friends you need to have renewal to keep things interesting keep mm. things exciting mm-hmm. but to do that you've got to be welcome to change and you've got mm. to be welcome to somebody becoming more competent and a more shining light than you. And There's and always going to be a new prince on the throne, you and, know? Mm. And when that it. occurs, then it's the maturity of the individual to say, well, I played a small part in that, and that is that aloha coming back. The yeah. thing is, when you become a winner, you know, you also, part of being a winner and having good sportsmanship or womenship is, you know, realizing the responsibility that, you know, becomes part of you once once you become that person. You have to be willing to you know, pass that on to the Simon next Nicole, generation or whatever. But Simon that and Nicole did that today, although I was disappointed when you guys went in. You were really saying we've surfed the venue yes all week and we surfed competition all day yesterday and we've and you came out because you were one of the better teams in the water with us today. You were able to get good waves and ride them and, and it was kinda like it was an aloha thing for you to say, let's you know, it's yours now. You paddled in and you gave it to a lot of the teams that were just learning. You know, yeah. And that's part of the you know what uh, aloha uh, means you know ha means breath you know it means mm. to and aloha means to give breath mm. and so yeah so I think with this kind of aloha I don't know if it needs to be any organizational thing but we can have we can definitely bring more of the aloha of tandem surfing to the world and keep the Olympic track going on the route that there, it there is there there is a huge proportion of people out there older people that are more than willing to share. But you've got to find the right way to ask them and the right mm-hmm. way to engage them. Uh, locally, where Nicole and I live, we have this dearth of surfing experience. The Northern Beaches of Sydney is home to a huge amount of very good surfers. One in particular is Bernard Far- Farrelly, Midget Farrelly is most people oh, know. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Midget um, is a local to our area. Now, a lot of people don't know Midget that well and they think he's a rather aloof kind of guy. It's far from the case. But he's more than happy to have a chat. And Nicole and I, going back four or five years now, when we were first starting, uh, it was howling a gale, but I, I knew it would, there'd be great surf somewhere, but I didn't know exactly what beach. Mm-hmm. And we just pulled over the side of the road and I saw Midge's car and I got out and said, Midge, where do we go that A is going to be great, it's going to be safe? And he said, well, wait an hour and a half, go to this spot. And he told us this spot and it'll be perfect within about an hour and 35 minutes. <laughs> we got there and it just went awesome. Yeah. And there was three or four guys out in the water and I saw him later and said, thanks so much. He said, any time, not a problem. Yet, regretfully, you know, in the press, some somebody might be seen rather differently. So I think there are people out there who are willing to give, willing to share, but we've got to find the right way to engage them. Let's do that. Let's do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I think my new saying too when I'm out in the water is, you know, what would Duke do? Yeah, yeah. That's what we were talking about the other day. And sometimes that's asking, and sometimes that's asking people, do you want me to give you advice? Or, you know, or um, can you give me advice? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. I think ways. about, I, I think I, ch- I check myself a lot in the water, what would Duke do? Or when someone's going off on me in the water, I will say, is this the way Duke would handle this? You know? Cause yeah, exactly. He, he's a, he, I know he means a lot to you. And my, as a boy, even though I was a young boy gr- growing up, up in Santa Cruz, the Duke legend had carried all the way there, and he was known not just for his being a powerful waterman, but for being having that aloha spirit. It's and part of that aloha, there is this wonderful description in the English language called hum- humility, and it is one thing that time and time again, whenever I'm around people of uh, Hawaii, in particular this table and and other friends that we get to meet here, new friends and old friends, it is the truly um, attractive people. Uh, the humble people, mm-hmm. 
they're willing to share they're willing to give something they don't get too wrapped up in things and you you do see that out in the water is that those people who are really 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 very good are those humble people that are more than happy to share and mm. we see it subconsciously in our break you see it at every home break regretfully though um, there aren't that many of them well speaking of sharing i think i'm going to just sit, be bold enough to say this if anybody's cares out there i think the number one thing that needs to happen in the competitive world of tandem surfing is you need to get the competitors off the board of directors you need to have a board of directors that's run like any other uh, uh, amateur you know um, Olympic type organization I think the minute you get the competitors off the board of directors you get people like Eileen or Andrew or others like that who love the sport or coach Mike from U of H you get people out there that love the sport are dedicated to the sport Eileen has traveled the world following tandem Andrew has fought, traveled the world following tandem people like that that are that love tandem and love the people of tandem as soon as you can get that board of directors to be run by non-competitors, things will get a lot simpler too. But that takes humility. That takes giving up uh, the throne, as you said, you know, and letting uh, kind of, you know, there's a time when you're birthing something and it takes all your power and all your might to make that happen. But then you got to let it go. It's like these two kids right here, you know, you got to let them go. And ITSA, I think Eileen helped me a lot like that a couple years ago, letting it go. We birthed it. We started it. It had its life. And we let it go. But the number one thing that I think that that either it happens or it doesn't happen. If it doesn't happen, I think I'm, unfortunately it'll, it'll continue to fade as it is. But if they can let go and invite these people that, like you said, like Midget Farley or even Nat Young, or, I mean, if you bring people into the into it that are love tandem, understand tandem, like Stephen Barry Bainey, who no longer compete. If you bring those people onto the board of directors to run it, then you don't have frenemies. Because one of the biggest challenges with ITSA is no, they keep the rules keep changing, or I don't know who's really making the rules. You know, and and even though they're probably doing their very best to be integritous, there's that appearance that's always an issue, right? So you, so the, so if you can, if that can happen, and then the focus can be less on female flexibility, more on actual agility. And, and that sort of thing. I think you can. We can. We can do both. We can revive the competitive spirit, and we can revive the the other element, which is the fun and the beauty part. One, one of, and taking on from that point, that maybe the most opportune time to do that would would be if we collectively um, recognised on the global scale that post the Duke event each year, that it would be nice to have an AGM. It would be nice to be have a meeting where we. We call it a post-mortem in the art world. It, you, we could well do that, mm -hmm. but it would be nice having the projection forward of saying what's worked well, what do we need to reassess, what do we need mm -hmm. to redress, and what do we need to endeavour and embark into. Well, Speaking I of sharing, by the way, too, you know, we're, this is a two-way street. Can Listeners, we, we want to make sure that you're sharing some of your adventures and some of your stories with us, too, about going out and tandem surfing for the first time. So please make sure and remember that you can always send your stories to us at Fawn at bearswave.com. Again, that's F A W N at bearswave.com. You can also find uh, contact information for us on www.bearswave.com. But we want to hear your stories too about tandem surfing. So I would like to take a ch second. No, stay, stay with us, Sam. Hey guys, um, hit Shane, us up. Contact us. Shane, can you give uh, a little bit of space there for Eileen now to sit in for a little bit? And you're going to yeah, sure. move on to the video area. Um, and I wanted to say, you know, I, I'd not. I, this is kind of interesting, almost like it's happening live. But I think that this, this what you're talking about, Simon. We're almost doing it right now, not so much in the terms of the competition area, but um, we've talked about this a lot too. About um, about um, the, the problem with, with the problem with the competition world is you have frenemies. You don't know who your friends or enemies are because you're comp you're you're teaching each other how to tandem one minute, and the next minute you go out and paddle against them, and you don't know. There's that kind of element there that that's kind of awkward and uncomfortable, which doesn't need to happen in the uh, in a, in a purely um, uh, hold, hold on one second. It doesn't need to happen if you're if you're just having fun. That kind of element doesn't need to happen. Fawn, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce Eileen in the studio. Hi. Eileen, how are you doing today? Doing wonderful. Can you fix We're your headset? We're really glad Shane? that you're here with us today. Shane's going to work okay. with your headset. Thank you. Eileen Lundy. To give you a little background on Eileen Lundy, Eileen is a um, dear, 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 dear friend, and Dennis Riley is as well. She also has really nice hair, by the way. <laughs> can, you ex can you explain how we, how we met? 
Oh, I sure can. Uh, it was five years ago, and my friend and I uh, were here on vacation, and uh, we were cruising the beach, and my girlfriend looked over, and she's like, oh my gosh, look at that. I looked over, and we saw Bear, and he was doing some lifts on the beach, and uh, Brenda goes, I love that. Let's go over there and meet him. So we went over, and she introduced herself to Bear, and I introduced myself, and uh, before I knew it, she was up in the air, and she was doing lifts, and uh, he says, yeah, hey, uh, I can get you out in the water, and she's like, really? You can? So I think within an hour, hour and a half or so, the next time I was looking over, there was Brenda doing a cradle to swan, coming in on a wave with Bear, and I'm like, oh my goodness. I just can't believe she's doing that. It's awesome. so neat. Eileen is so knowledgeable about tandem, and yet you don't tandem surf. No, I wish I could. But you, well, the reason why you were in Hawaii was what? A couple of reasons. One is to recover from a surgery that I had had. Uh, we had initially had planned a trip to go to the Virgin Islands, and uh, just two days prior to us leaving on that trip, I had an accident, hurt my arm. So I looked up at Brenda and I said, I don't think we're going to St. Thomas. And that was in uh, April. So then I got to feeling better in June and uh, she had a ticket that she had to use before uh, the middle of July. And so we decided to both come to Hawaii together. And uh, that's what we did. We were gonna spend three days in Waikiki Beach and three days in Maui and then three days in LA. And that was gonna be our big trip. And uh, so we got here and had so much fun in three days. And I think we met you towards the end of that third day. And uh, by that time, I just looked at her and I said, we're having too much fun here. There's no way I'm going to go to Maui. <laughs> and mm. she looked great. So we ended up staying here. I think we ended up two weeks, actually, until the day her ticket expired was the day <laughs> we left. <laughs> Which is what you seem to do all the time. You always That's seem right. to extend your stay. <laughs> well, we were down to the hair of the chinny chin chin, really, if she didn't make that flight. And hers was a confirmed seat, so first class. So she definitely wanted to make it. If not, she was going to lose it and have to go back on one of my buddy passes. But uh, anyway, she didn't end up having to do that. So instead of going to St. Thomas, um, it was kind of a spiritual direction here to Hawaii. And I would say from that meeting, a lot of people have had major um, meetings, the meetings of friends, and mm -hmm. uh, and it just- It's uh, the gathering it, place Oahu, right? That's it what it did. means. It did. It planted so many seeds from that one trip. Um, if I go back and I look at the past five years, some of my nearest and dearest friends have, are the friends that were a result of planting those seeds back five years ago and well, meeting let, everybody. Let's take a quick break here. We're not really going anywhere, but would you give us the gift of another 45 minutes or do you guys need to do something this afternoon? We're apparently meeting you at 10 to 6. Well, can can you give us 45 minutes? Is that okay? I've, I've, I've got no idea. I haven't got a laptop in front of me or a oh, phone, which is wonderful. No, no, I'm saying that. Uh, is, um, can you stay? Well, yes, of course. Okay, because I just think this is serendipitous too, because we have Eileen Lundy here. Yes, Fawn? I'm done. Fawn is out. Yeah. Okay, I'm out. aloha. I gotta go do you gotta go, other production. You got your work next now. production. Okay. Good. I love you, daughter. Bye, guys. Okay. So, uh, Shane, you can take Fawn's place. But I wanted to say that Eileen being here is really special because Eileen Lundy and Brenda and Lance Mackey helped us birth tandem surfing on the East Coast. There was no tandem surfing coming. Yeah. And if it weren't for you, so I, I think it'd be good for you to hear this, uh, Simon, because it gives us a vision of how things can be done mm -hmm. and how things can be. Uh, oh, it, it just blossomed. I think, uh, well, you took us to that uh, production. It was a Beach Boys film that we were, went that evening. And um, you presented or, you know, opened it. It was the it, MC or something. MC, yeah. right. And then there was a Hawaiian dinner afterwards. And uh, after that, it, we, you and I were, were talking. And I said, you know, this is such a neat thing. And I just looked at Brenda and how excited she was with tandem surfing. I said, you know, wouldn't this be great if we could bring it to Florida? And uh, at that point, I think I mentioned to you, I said, I would love to have you invite you to our surf festival, which we have every Labor Day weekend. It's something new. We've not seen it on the East Coast. I've never seen it. And I grew up on the beach and all my life was around surfers, surfed and uh, have family in the industry. I said, you've got to come and do this. So that was July. And by September, 
Bear was on his way with some of his uh, members of the Tandem World here, and uh, we introduced it to NKF. Crazy Todd Robertson. <laughs> Crazy Todd, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got as many people as we could over, and um, it was just an experience. And, and literally, I'm, the people on the East Coast, when they actually saw the Tandem Surfing, they would just stop and just stare. Thousands. Thousands of people. And instead of the cameras going to the surfers that, you know, it's really kind of hard to tell. I mean, a surfer is a surfer, not saying anything bad, but you can't really distinguish people out in the water as you can when somebody's tandem surfing. I mean, it makes such a powerful statement. So as a spectator, I mean, people that were never interested really in surfing that just kind of came to the festival for other reasons drew into surfing at that point. They all stopped and looked at the waves and looked at the um, tandem surfers doing lifts and real curious about it and wanted to you know find out more about it and uh, the following year uh, when we actually had a little bit more organized uh, the media was more involved uh, we had a lot of media we made out. it an ITSA event yes we did year. that was second our, year that's yeah. right that's right with the help of Lance and you and we uh, got it an event and uh, I mean, I think it was it was very well covered. I mean, in our local media, we had all the major news channels uh, showing footage about every 30 minutes of a tandem team surfing and coming in on a wave. And uh, we have a local channel, too, and they were doing their promos about every 15 minutes with a surfer. But let me ask you this question. But let me ask you this question. Who cares? <laughs> let, me, let me say it like this. Simon and Nicole are here. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about tandem surfing mm -hmm. while you haven't been here. I would say a good part of what we've discussed and what Simon keeps coming back to is is, the, is Duke Kahanamoku mm -hmm. and the Aloha. And that's what this event about is about in Hawaii. It's mm -hmm. about Duke and bringing and raising money so that the local Hawaiian kids can learn more of the Hawaiian traditional sports. Mm -hmm. Well, what good is it if we come to Cocoa Beach and all the cameras are looking at the tandem teams that in and of itself, I mean, it's interesting, it's beautiful, but what really, what I really love about it is it helped us bring a focus to the Kidney Foundation. It did, it did. And that's, that's what the good of it was. That was a good part of it. Um, you know, we have a following that follows the NKF, and they're out there every year. And then, of course, Labor Day weekend's a, a huge thing on our coast. It kind of ends our summer, and we get a lot of people from Orlando because. Orlando's in the middle, so uh, if you're in or the Central Florida area, you have the choice of going to the East Coast or the West Coast, depending on where, what hurricanes are coming in or what storms or where <laughs> the waves are better. So to get that draw of people from the center of the state over to our coast, you know, we kind of have to throw some things um, at them. And the tandem surfing brought people over. They had they saw the promos on it, and they were like, "Boy, this is neat. I've never seen it before." So they wanted to come out to. Uh, see the tandem surfing. You missed a, a really cool conversation we're having with um, Simon and Nicole about the, the 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 status of tandem surfing and the need to have not just the Olympic track but also um, the expression of it in its beauty and its mm -hmm. fun elements. And um, I know you have a heart for that too. Definitely. And I wonder if you could take delicately give us a perspective of, of where you how you because you've seen it. You were there from the beginning mm -hmm. with I of the beginning of the co competition phase of tandem, again, the rebirth of it, and where in your heart you see tandem surfing can be going? Well, there's two thoughts on it, and uh, one is from the spectator level. I enjoy watching the teams, and to be honest with you, there's the complicated lifts and the non-complicated lifts, but some of the simplest lifts, I believe, are the most beautiful lifts, and when a team's coming in and they're doing, like, a one arm back or it can't even be you know a, a swan a, it's the swan I, they, it just looks so graceful and it's just so beautiful watching it and to watch a person do it more frequently to me I enjoy then I on the competitive part of it I think you lose some of it because it's so technical and so the spectator loses out because you only have a certain heat that people are doing other than when they're practicing and it has to be so staged and every, they're so focused, which I think that's a good thing. There, there's a, a need for that for the competitive side. But at the same sense, I think having you know, the spectator part of it um, draws a lot of people out. And if it's not so um, 
serious as it is in competition, if it's more relaxed and people are out there doing it because they're having fun, it's, it just seems like the crowds are really pleased with that. They're really happy. They, they love watching it. And I think it gives the tandem teams a little bit more um, expression to be able to show the beauty of tandem. Well, one of the things is when you're competing, you're doing three second, uh, because of the rule, everyone mm -hmm. out there, because there's this three second rule of you hold the lift for three seconds, you're holding it for three, you're spinning it to the next lift, to go into the next lift, so you're trying to do three or four lifts on one right. wave. They don't really get to really see what it is really going on, and then it's moving. And then um, the other thing about it is, like the emphasis on the girl's feet have to hit the board, but mm -hmm. she doesn't have to dismount cleanly. You see a lot of, actually, injuries where they're pushing their limits, going too far into the shallow yeah. water, hitting to that. I mean, we saw, you see that in a lot. Oh, yeah. Cocoa Beach has hard sand. It does. I think Debbie learned that the hard How way. How many people <laughs> have had ankle injuries? Yes. Because they the get teams up are too close. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing just the beauty, that the last thing you would do is want to have your partner hit the sand. You'd be mm -hmm. focusing on... I mean the sand underneath the water, right? Yeah. yeah. You'd yeah. want to focus on, on the girl doing a beautiful dismount. Right. Well, our water is real murky, um, mm -hmm. especially with the waves creating uh, the suction it does. We have the sandbars are moving yeah, around. Yeah, we have a lot of um, uh, swells that come in, and, it, and, and just our water in general, it's never crystal clear. So you can't see that it's not two or three feet below you. So when you're coming in off a wave, and depending on where the tide is, you don't know if it's one inch or one foot or well, two feet. <laughs> I'm going to give you so. this. I want to, Eileen, I trust you so much. And I think everyone in the tandem world knows how much you love tandem and love them. Everyone you've embraced. I've given you this opportunity to talk, talk to us as what you would see uh, it, it, a direction for tandem whether like talk to us a little bit about the competition area mm -hmm. and talk to us a little bit about this expression a beauty area and just kind of share with us your heart I think it's so beautiful that Simon and Nicole are here mm -hmm. because it's kind of like the stage for Simon and Nicole in Australia is kind of like where you were five years ago mm -hmm. as far as developing this and mm -hmm. well I'd like to see it developed um, I envision it that it could possibly have the components of it to make it um, like an exhibition team where there's uh, maybe uh, a handful of people that can, you know, have a little bit of flexibility or travel. If you could get some sponsors that would sponsor some teams. Um, you know, it's such a good venue for any waterman sport that's coastal that if you had a tandem team there just on an exhibition level, that, uh, you know, a, a, it would be a promotional uh, activity and, and something that would draw more people in. So, like for some of the surf contests or uh, some of the water sports um, that we have, I think it would be great to have like a, a group of people that are, you know, just on some sort of team that that's all that they do, that they can, you know, kind of syn synchronize things or, or have some sort of a show, but where yeah. it's more of a show mm -hmm. uh, to please the people. Like the old Hobie, the old Hobie team used to show up with those Hobie clothes mm -hmm. and Simon and Nicole, we've talked about. We actually had an informal board of directors put together for this. We just mm -hmm. It's kind of like the right thing at the wrong time, waiting for the right things to come together. Well, you look but at yeah. like Cypress Gardens, who mm -hmm. for which, years which had Nicole that Nicole knows show. about. Yeah. Not Cypress Gardens, but you saw, you saw stunt uh, skiing, water skiing. Yes. Yeah, well, in Australia. That lasted for years in Central Florida. Um, you know, it, it was just a ski show. But people enjoyed watching people on the back of a boat, holding mm -hmm. onto a rope, doing very similar to what the lifts are for tandem and that park stayed in business for years you and know, we it, talked about having um six or seven or eight teams that are part of this this expression session group um that could dedicate themselves to showing up to half of the events that we that we were going to do and wouldn't it be fun to, sh to have an expression session team show up in australia to go to your different, we never got to talk that much about your um, ocean safety, what do you call it, your life-saving club? S surf life saving. Yeah, and show up like that and, 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 and uh, do and, and teach. And you're wearing, you're wearing these kind of, you're wearing like a, a, a team jersey, but it's not like it's all the teams on our expression session team, say we have six or seven or eight of them all wear these, have the same backpacks or whatever. When we show up, it's, it's a visual impact. But then we take that, like when we're, I don't know if we're going to get to do it this year in Cocoa Beach, but we want to take that those cameras that are focusing on us in the water and take them to where the children are having their dialysis, you know? And that then tandem surfing can have a real aloha meaning. Mm. Mm. It, it takes it from being about just you, mm -hmm. the participant, to being about the joy it gives somebody mm -hmm. else. 
and um, I think just taking on from what you've spoken about there is from the spectator's point of view is that they really don't know the difference between what they is don't. what is lift number one mm-hmm. and what is lift number fifty two. They have they have no clue and actually. If we if we looked at it purely from a return on investment, if I can be as, as blunt. Don't you love this the, guy? <laughs> the spectator is providing that investment. So what is going to give them the greatest satisfaction? And it is something that is attractive to them, which they will want to go then and advocate to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And a wonderful lesson for Nicole and I was two years ago, two or three years ago, Steve and Barry Bainey came back out to Noosa on the condition that they were just there to help, but they wouldn't compete. Now I thought that was wonderful. And we competed and we did well, and there was a number of teams that did very well. But this but was a, not an ITSA competition. No, no, no. This was just the Noosa was, Festival and, of Surfing. And don't say it was just. It, it is the Noosa Festival, this which is, the Noosa is probably Festival, which a is premier event of, yeah, of surfing and, festivals. And just Australia. because you didn't fit, you didn't decide to get inside an, a box. Hang, hang on, let me finish the argument. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, part, talking point. The, what Stephen Barry did was, in the few days leading up to the actual tandem competition on the finals day, just tandem, because they don't do it anymore just tanned at Tea Tree and a couple of other little places. And uh, a couple who Nicole and I know exceptionally well and are very, very well respected in the world of surfing were very blunt and said, look, you guys are good, but you're nothing on that old couple. And respectfully, you know, Steve and Barry are in their 60s now, but Barry does it so beautifully and gracefully that you can be Mar and Pa Kettle from the back of Mecca Tharo, sitting on the beach and think, I don't know who that couple is, but they're the best. And it's because they presented it so well and so beautifully that it, it's graceful. It was athletic, it was feminine, but also it was, it was masculine in the way in which Steve surfed as well. And I think if we can start to recognise things from a spectator's point of view, as well as continuing our goal of the pursuit of excellence, of what Olympia right. is, yeah. that we need to be able to find what is this happy balance. And I think we're constantly challenged about that in any sport which is subjective. We've seen it in ice skating, we've seen it in equestrian, we've seen it in anything where a subjective measure as such is included. Well, I saw, when I was, um, I don't know, about 20 years ago, I was out, I was with a buddy and we were someplace out in the country and we were running on railroad tracks. Have you ever tried that? Very hard to do. You know, run about 10 steps and then you're falling off. Run about 10 steps and then falling off. And then he's running and then we kind of try to have a race. And at some point we're falling and his hand, arm grabs my arm and I grab his arm. We could run for miles because we grabbed each other's arms. And that's why I see these two tracks, the Olympic track and this expression se- session track. If you run together, Wait, you can go forever. Sorry, where were you doing this? Well, I just it was, a, it was at a retreat place in Texas. Oh, yeah. Just happened to do it. Oh, yeah, that one thing. Yeah, yeah. But Eileen... Um, talk to us a little bit about what you see, um, because we talked briefly about this. What you see could, if you could do three things in the competition arena, you have the right to speak. You've given so much and you've been so loving and so good to everybody. What would be one or two or three things that you would say, twist this, change this, make this happen? The competition environment would be better off for it. Um, well, I agree with you on the uh, board of directors. Um, I, I have seen in the past where being on the competitive end of it, you don't mean to do it, but sometimes you slant the rules or you slant the advantage to a little bit of what you, your vision is. And when you're, when you're a competitor and you're trying to do something for the good of everybody, there's just that little part of you, and you don't mean to do it, but I think that there's just a little part of somebody that says, not really what's in it for me, but this is the way I think it should be. And it might not necessarily be the way that it should be for the good of the group. And sometimes people that are too close don't have have a chance to see that. Um, They can't take the two or three steps back and think, okay, is this a really good decision for the group? And sometimes when that happens, you lose some members because people get upset. I also think that there's no voting uh, power for ITSA. For, I think it's for for who who would be the voters? The teams. The, the teams should be the voters. Mm. Um, I think it should be set up more like a traditional organization where you have a president, mm. vice president, mm. secretary, and treasurer. Mm. You have members. You have members that pay dues, mm-hmm. uh, and those dues can go for you know getting the venues or you know setting up things. 
there can be, I think there should be an award system for if there's money left over, maybe you could win some travel points or incentives. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if, if everybody got kind of really into this and everybody got it together, they could even go to people like the head Sky Miles and say, mm -hmm. Can you donate so many Sky Miles to for our the, teams? The, Which you, for our do, teams. you do do anyway. We, yeah, we try to do that with with passes, but that isn't always a really good thing. But um, people that have like just frequent flyer miles that mm -hmm. wouldn't mind maybe giving sixty thousand frequent flyer miles uh, every year to, well, that to was, tandem teams. Mm -hmm. But if 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 you had that and you had the members of ITSA able to have a say so on things, you can have. Uh, something brought up that might be a good idea from any member. Mm -hmm. It could be voted on, you know, ele in the electronic age. It would just mm -hmm. be a matter of, of voting on it. They could say yes or no if it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I think people would, one, present more ideas. Second of all, I'd give everybody a chance to voice their opinions of what's good for the group. And then, you know, I think that that's the only way you can get an organization no, that, to grow. That was my point of departure when I resigned from the board was because I wanted to see the board become a non-competition board. I wanted the competitors to have an advisory committee that was voted in, mm -hmm. that was part of the board but was a non-voting area. Or if they were going to be voters, there should be four, three, you know, that there should be the non-competition element of the board should be, um, you know, the ones that were had the, the ruling vote. So if you had five people, three of them would be non-competitors. But I really felt like that the, the if you're going to have competitors on that board, you better have they better be voted in, and they better have the they better be representing a constituency, not just their own will. So I see that you know there was that original birthing time when Rico and I started ITSA. It was just Rico and me, and I said maybe we should invite Kristen and Huntington to be a part of it. So then we have more of a third person. We have a female. We have a California team, but we were birthing it. Mm -hmm. But you gotta let your child go. And I think but at that point, it was like we did, everyone, Rico and everybody put their heart and soul into that thing. But for the good of Tanner, now I think it's time. And I'm not going to say anything more about this. But I, I think for the good of Tanner, now that board has to become a non-competition. There should be no competitors on that board. And there should be an advisory committee voted on. And I like what you say. Nowadays, you can do that little survey thing on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And all the teams can give their votes within yeah. two days. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and if, um, I I would say if the, if the, tandem teams voted for a certain thing that the majority rules would be a good way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've been in organizations for a long time. I've been a professional volunteer for many years. You're, you're trained as a, I'm you're trained, trained in running nonprofits, uh, right. you're run, not nonprofits, you're trained in running um, Pretty much volunteer, volunteer, but, but volunteer groups. organizations. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, in fact, I was a member of uh, the Junior League, which is known as an organization that teaches women to help uh, communities by empowering them to um, start organizations like that. And all of them, I mean, if you look at um, the Roger rules of, mm -hmm. you know, anything, mm -hmm. it goes and it has a, a working structure that mm -hmm. works. So the structure isn't something new. It's been around for hundreds of years. Yeah, well, there's and actually minutes and votes taken. Minutes mm -hmm. and votes, accountability, transparency, um, a lot of good things. But you cannot have growth until you get the people that are involved with it to all have an equal say. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going to end up hurting people's feelings or stepping on people's toes, and they're not going to think things are fair. So mm -hmm. until you get something set up, I think on a proven system that's been around for years, I don't think that it's going to grow like it should I always should wanted grow. her to be the president. Well, <laughs> I, I think we have to be cognizant if we look at a, a, a pure sporting background, and, and Nicole's and my background is surf lifesaving. Mm -hmm. There's 305 clubs in Australia that consists of well over 100,000 volunteers. Um, the northern beaches of Sydney, some clubs, Freshwater, for example, we have over 1,000 members. And then we have an executive that is voted in each year. And, and the majority of those people on executive um, are not competitors. So they must have an impartial view. However, we do have um, uh, opinion bodies that present the mm -hmm. opinion of a certain group of people, and that goes to the executive, and the executive then decides on the allocation of monies, mm -hmm. on the allocation right. of resources, what is best in meeting the vision and the mission of the organisation. And so we must have a charter of, of accounts mm -hmm. as such. And on a, on a private side, Nicole and I um, own our own company, 
um, it's it's had significant growth, and we've just sent out Survey Monkey. So when you yes, that, Survey it, Monkey, it yeah. hit me, um, and I've had a member of my team do that, and I've had no part in it whatsoever, and the feedback's been wonderful, to the point now that we know that we have to have a board that is separate to the employees, and I take my direction from that board because I have an emotional engagement. Exactly. It's, it's my it's respectfully it's it's our dollars that do it right but if we don't do that then we're not going to be in a position to grow and I think you're I think that's a very wise decision and I think it's important for us as tandem servers to recognize that by relinquishing that control that we all to some element want in life it allows us to welcome someone who may not actually be active in a competition but has a sincere and passionate interest in it mm-hmm. and we also need to recognize is just because someone is exceptionally good at one element of their life and let's say tandem surfing doesn't mean they're successful in another element which may be impartiality and thought process or maybe the ability to raise money or it may be the ability to engage new people well that's another thought too because a lot of i'm sorry to jump in but if you have a really good working board there's always that kind of sister board that's the fundraising part mm-hmm. of the board. You know, if you had this was functioning good, you'd have people like Andrew King that would love to come in and serve that function mm-hmm. in the fundraising. Correct. Be- yeah. Because to, I'm, I'm still struggling to come to the point, and I shouldn't say that because we all know the industry. And by the surf industry, respectfully, it's Billabong, Quicksilver, Rip Curl, Hurley, Volcom, or I knew all the other organisations that, that derive considerable amount of monies from doing this why there's no engagement in tandem. There could be, if it was organised well, if it was represented exactly. well, exactly. and if exactly. you were able to demonstrate to those people who were asking for an investment of mm-hmm. monies, and not in product, I must say, we should always look for monies, mm-hmm. by saying, should you provide an opportunity for tandem at the Quicksilver Pro on the Gold Coast, mm-hmm. or at this or that or that? Right you're going to open up the market to this spectator and this spectator will be able to attend and with them attending, well, they'll bring a purse or a wallet and that purse or wallet will be spending money on a good or service that no doubt will have an association with your body. So that's one element of the surf industry. The other element which we fail to recognise is that, you know, we've just seen Nike, 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 however you say that, dabble their foot into surfing now. But we've got significant companies, whether it's Puma, Adidas, Xerox, Perrier Water, uh, whoever it is, non-surfing, non-surfing yeah. entities right. that would turn around and say, "You're doing this in uh, in Florida? Oh my gosh, how many people are there? We have X amount of hundred thousands there. Right. This year, could he? Is he basically just saying word for word what you you yeah. said? And I, th- we we need to get to that point. And I think Eileen has those connections, but she won't bring the current confusion to them. And I think that's why we need to take this step back. And I think if people are able to see what could be, but that needs to have some clear partiality, impartiality, I should say, they'll say, gee, I can see how not only I can benefit, but how others may benefit from this in future. And that allows us to have, um, respectfully, from width you get depth, from including as many people in a movement, then you get the depth of expertise. So for every Paulie and Crystal, Chuck and Lauren, Laleo and Megan, Kalani and Tiffany, if we look at the four finalists, uh, we may be in an pr- opportunity where we could have 10, 12, 16 teams at that level, but at the same time we may have 25 to 40 teams at another level. So from that we're still allowing Olympia to be achieved if we look at tandem surfing, but we're allowing the social demographic to be engaged and from those social people we'll find lawyers, accountants, solicitors, uh, philanthropists, venture capitalists, Mm -hmm. plumbers, tradesmen, whoever. I couldn't agree more with you because that is exactly what Bear and I have been talking about and getting that kind of a model together, you know, the more people we can engage into seeing how successful it would be. I think it would really get the momentum of the tandem surfing going. If we started it in the expression session arena instead of... The whole reason I co-founded ITSA was not to have competition. It was to express... was to expand tandem surfing. That's what I love to do. Mm-hmm. If we did this with expression sessions first, kind of organized, not overly organized, but here we got a 
Ma- master's degree in psychology, mm-hmm. is it? And in in, in your PhD we're, we're, in psychology? No, no. <laughs> the PhD is he's still on the back burner, but we're but in, I mean, this, we, we're in the same old school. We school. got two psycho okay, people psychologists. who, yes, same. yeah. We which should is do a Dr. Phil episode now. No, we need, yeah, on me. <laughs> but uh, uh, we take the we take the we ask the questions though. We don't like answering them. Yeah, but you guys, yeah, <laughs> the, the tide, you know, the tide is turned. But I think that uh, if we did this in the expression session area and just showed how it could be done where you have the teams that are involved have this advisory board and there's a uh, I think it doesn't I, I'm very leery of over organizing it but to uh, but to, to, to birth something like that when we go into Australia again Australia experiences Aloha instead of here let me take this sledgehammer to you mm-hmm. or when we go in, like when we went into Florida we came in when we went into, into Virginia Beach the first year it was a fun fest mm-hmm. no ITSA judge when I took Tandem into there, when we took it into Cocoa Beach, Fun Fest, no, no ITSA rules. Um, in, in Waikiki, we would have Fun Fest. They didn't even know we were doing contests. The people paddle out in the middle of canoes, break it and we're having a contest, nobody even knows it. And that stirred up the 16 teams in six weeks, you know, right. type thing. So, mm-hmm. so if we could let this thought kind of incubate a little bit, maybe uh, something... Per- well, another element that I find challenging too on the competitive side is coming up with money to pay out purses. Uh, you know, that is a big. Why uh, does it's, it's a it's a big burden on the person that has to come up with the money for a, an event to get it, a sanctioned ITSA event, whether it's a six star, five star, four star. Um, I, for a six star example, you're looking at um, six thousand dollars as a purse. Plus, there's some kind of extra. I'm not involved with ITSA anymore, but I think. There's an additional amount too. We used to always pay into France for uh, for um, um, sanctioning fees or something. Correct. So it's expensive. But you know what's sad about that? What was sad to me about that is like at the Duke Ocean Fest. I, first of all, I'm not tooting my own horn, but I think uh, you lead by example. Any money I ever won that was at a nonprofit event, I gave back. You know and. Um, Duke Ocean Fest. Whenever we've come in, we've paid the, the beach fees here are about seven, sixteen hundred an hour. It's very it, to me that's expensive. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone else in the world pays beach fees, but here at the Duke Ocean Fest we do. So we pay right. those beach fees. Then we have to. But whenever we've done that, we've always even if it was only an extra hundred dollars, we gave more than what covered the expense of the event. And then, and what's what I don't like to see is when you go into a place like National Kidney Foundation, and maybe eight thousand dollars is raised, but it all goes to the competitors. And there's no money going to the charity. The whole event is about the charity. It's not about it is, yeah. the gl- coming in and taking glory and taking money. If we could, sorry, if we could do something different in even the pursuit of competitive surfing, let's let's pick the top sixteen. None of those individuals, men or women, from what I understand, align themselves with an organisation that would benefit from monies of some kind. And that could be um, National Kidney Foundation. Well, we, yeah, we, that could be cancer. That could be lymphomas. We do, we that do could National be, Kidney Foundation and Warrior Wounded Warriors. It could well. We'll come on to access surf in a tick. But mm-hmm. by setting that as part of the charter, that um, uh, tandem surfers of the world, or who, however that organisation is, chooses each. Um, I think each year would be a little challenging, but every second year, an organisation that we support. And, and that can be a, a, an organisation that's chosen mm-hmm. to roll over by the majority, mm-hmm. then at least that is an attractive pursuit for some of those organisations yes. saying, this is are we just going to benefit you as a group? And we say, actually, no, we're a little bit different from that. What we're doing is bringing the spirit of aloha and this will benefit this group here right. in some form of payment, which has a real outcome. Mm-hmm. And... I, I do struggle when you find elite athletes don't do that at every opportunity, regardless of whether they're earning ten thousand a year or ten million a year. Well, we say we we would we were saying we would choose four and roll them, so you could have four charities that you're taking that you're working with, but you can evolve with them over time. And I think a lot of the charitable events would you know want. If it's a sporting or a water event, would want like a tandem team there to, to bring in people. Um, again, you know, there's that fine line though, because you're raising money for a charity, and at the same time, you're having to pay out. A well, I don't person. want it personally. My heart is I'm I'm 
personally, my heart is over with competition, but mm -hmm. that, that that's still an important area. But it, I would love is. to see a first birth expression mm -hmm. sessions where you come in, you're not taking a penny in purse. You're coming in just to give. And that would be that would be a, a great thing to do. Um, again, on the other end of it, though, you would have to have something uh, available to help some of these teams get out because yes. having the purse yeah. is an enticement to get some of these teams. But to when you have that, venue. when you have that, when you they come in, they're wearing the team gear, and it says Pepsi Cola on the back right. of their shirt, and, that and that's sort what of we thing. We wanted to bring here. sponsors yeah. in to get the teams to come. Why have prize money? The, you know use that money to get the teams that C are Correct. Half and, and that can be, if we just use Australia for example, I know so many people would love to come to Noosa or the Snowy, which is at Manly, mm -hmm. or any of the other events we have. But the, the cost of travel is so prohibitive mm -hmm. that it's regretfully not an easily doable option. If through a, um, an alignment with an organisation the prize money is not so much the importance. It is that we're able to get you from A to B instead of being right. two and a half thousand dollars. It will cost you five hundred dollars. Right. right. Yet in that five hundred dollars, this is the return on investment that has been bequeathed to you, is that you are to be engaged in this community service. You were able to help in this lesson. You were able to do these kind of things. Now, I, I do believe people would willingly do that, and I'll, I'll use Rico as an example. I, I dearly admire Rico. Is that the first time he we met? Rico, he had a million one people doing all the lifts in, you know, speaking out French to all these different people and a bit of English here and there, but he engaged and he gave willingly back. I think tandem people would be more than happy to do that. But again, this comes back to a charter where we need to establish this as an understanding of the assistance that could be or would be provided. Well, we talked about having a kind of a report card. If you wanted to be, you had to be invited to be on the team, which I don't know if you would need to do that. But there's a report card, and the report card wouldn't be how great your lifts were. Be did you show up to, to do the kidney dialysis? Did you do these sorts of things? And we and once a year you get to be on right. We were yeah, developing because we you were starting to do ideas. these lists. Yeah. Of the, yeah, that 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 if you wanted to be back on the team, did you perform mm -hmm. as a team member? Not so much, did you just show up? But did you did you do these other things that we wanted to mm -hmm. do for the expression session? This is just expression session. Yeah, and could you envision the same as I do, like having a, uh, let's say maybe a team of. 10, 10 people, but maybe only six could show up to an event, maybe mm -hmm. even if you got four, because that's a pretty good showing. They're all dressed in the same outfits. They have their bags. They have, and, and everything's sponsor-driven. And I could see where you could go to some of these major people and present that and say, you know, again, this is a return on the investment. Everybody's looking at the tandem teams when they're surfing. I mean, it is a showstopper. So what you would get, you know, on the return for your marketing or your advertising is huge. I, I mean, think we could get Chic Hydro. I, I think if it was presented well, but you, you know, when you go in and you have to promote this to a company, you really have to have your ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. just go in and arbitrarily say, well, we've been haphazardly doing this and we've got this and this and this. I mean, it has to be a structured plan. I think it has to have some backing. It has to have... Um, actually some investors that are willing mm. to invest in and they're it. there and we have those we we certainly mm. do have the basis for it and we've got enough uh people in it that are professional people that do have the funds available to be able to launch something but what, like this what we love is here's eileen and we know a lot of people like her that are just dedicated to tandem surfing and don't tandem surf we need to engage them they've been you've been pushed to the side and we need to bring you well, and engage you let's look at a, a a tool that we could all use Let, i'll use survey monkey i know that is a product but online surveys that are a dime a dozen we could be able to over if we set ourselves a goal for 90 days and over 90 days we find people who are interested parties in the future of tandem surfing and that can be participants mm -hmm. that can be friends of that can be people who would like to aspire to. That could be potential um, corporates as such sponsors. Mm -hmm. and, and we may have a um, hundred responses. Of those hundred responses, we may have ten from elite competitors, uh, twenty from those who give it a go. Mm -hmm. But we may find we have seventy from those who wish to be taking part. And we can ask questions of: Should the opportunity arise, what role would you like to play? Oh, I think that's should something occur here how could you assist if we're able to do that and you will find from that um, opportunity you will identify 
um, those who may would like to be considered to be part of a board, those who would like to be not part of a board would like to be part of fundraising, those who would like to coach, those who would like to do those things. That, that is the beauty of now the web is that we can access mm-hmm. all those things and people respectfully, I, Nicole and I have only just met you now, but there's definitely an alignment there in thought process. Mm-hmm. Oh, Yet there is. We Isn't can access that through... Um, our business uses a wiki where we would hear from different people in our team about anonymous ideas that they will champion. Mm-hmm. We can do that and then within the space of 90 days at least have a very broad framework of strategic priorities before we go any further. Well, let's let's say that's okay because we got to bring this podcast into a into the barn pretty soon. I've never seen Eileen's leg shake like that. <laughs> She's so excited about this. Yes. She's so fully energized. I do. Either, either don't, that don't, or let's do be that. honest, she needs to find a bathroom. Do, do you <laughs> feel like you're about to burst, Eileen? Don't you feel like you're about to burst? No, but I, I, I take pride in the tandem. And I, and I do, when I see the teams come to Florida and I see the tandem serving, I see the crowds and I see how happy they are. I see the people lined up on the pier and they're just standing there with their cameras and it's a it's a big production. Mm-hmm. There's that warming in my heart because it's like, you know, this was something that we kind of planted the seeds for and look kinda, at how, you it, did it. how it took off. Yeah. And I, I just know how happy it makes me and I know how happy it makes a lot of people that love to see Tandem. I just think it's such a good thing that it needs to go in a positive direction and I, want to see uh, the members of ITSA and all the team people uh, just be able to thrive and I think if there's some basis of some of the things that we've talked about and not just keep it on I think the competitive end is such a focus it's like you're tunneling down to a very small goal it's a it's a huge goal in a way right but it's like you have the funnel and it's going down to a very very tiny little outlet Mm -hmm. and that's not a good role model for tandem (laughs) it it needs to be that that whole thing needs to be cut off and it flipped over or flipped over right exactly it should be the opposite it should be Mm -hmm. the tiny hole at the top and the pouring out at the look at today the expression Mm -hmm. session exactly look at this Uh, my daughter and another girl paddled out together Mm -hmm. having a blast Mm -hmm. moses with three little girls on his board and the best of all as you guys are paddling in, in with showing Aloha to give us a little bit more waves, a new team just paddled out. I mean, I knew the beach boy. He grabbed some girl off the beach. He said he couldn't stand anymore. He wanted to be out there that. with us. <laughs> that's that's the funnel being flipped over. Well, I was announcing, and a couple of things that I would keep telling uh, the people on the beach is, you know, hey, guys, you can do this. You know, in fact, I use the analogy. I, I, I said... Think about 1930s when, you know, Duke was out here and the Beach Boys, how they would just take a tourist and say, hey, you want to go on my board with me? Get them out in the water. And they were out in the water and they were doing a shoulder sit and they were coming in on the beach and how excited the tourists got. So I was trying to get that momentum going with the crowd out there. And I was also telling them too, Bear, that they could go on your website and watch the We had a lot of had. hits yesterday on our website. I told them that they we could go on your website, look at your mm-hmm. video of how to actually do Bearswave.com. the list. Bearswave.com. Bearswave.com. Yeah. And I told them they could go on, they could look and see how to do an, the initial lifts, like a cradle into the swan uh, on land, and that uh, you know they could give it a try. Mm-hmm. That I was empowering them to, to want to do that today. Mm-hmm. So hopefully took that into consideration. Simon's so. got one more. Just And I know we're just wrapping up. One little organization that has done exceptionally well uh, is a company called Global Surf Industries. Um, they are the producers of, of surfboards around the world, and they produce quite a bit. They're in competition to SurfTech, C4, um, mm-hmm. BoardWorks, Nash, all these others. But the, the, the gentleman that owns that company has developed a motto over the last few years, and now it's been pinched for lack of a better frame and it's life is better when you surf mm. and Kel is this gent's nickname and Kel has made it the ethos of his company is to encourage as many people as possible to surf and he's copped a bit of flack because why are you putting more people in the water and he says I think you're missing the point could you imagine if we're surrounded by people that benefit from this aloha and stoke that you and I do 
how much calmer it would be out there, mm-hmm. how much easier it would be to shop, how much better it would be to do business and the like. Yeah, they're acting mm-hmm. greedy. Oh, yeah. Correct. So exactly what you're saying is going back to the, the 30s when the Beach Boys originally wanted people out into the water, I like to believe that they were wanting to say, this is something we've got, we want to share it with you. And if we can mm-hmm. wrap up with that point of tandem is yes. that I think in a very... Um, altruistic way subconsciously is that that's what we're trying to do is that this is a pretty cool thing mm-hmm. why don't we share it I, I hope Duke Hanamoku is listening and we honour him through yes. the Duke Ocean Fest that we just ex- are experiencing right now as we go on and and we want to make sure we always think about that like Vaughn said earlier what would Duke do so let's leave with that thought what would Duke mm-hmm. do in terms of this gift of tandem surfing he gave to us and uh, I'd like to say, thank Eileen Lundy my dear 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 friend from Cocoa Beach Florida Simon and Nicole Finn who have become dear friends uh, my daughter Naomi Fawn and to Shane Wozniak. You're going to take us out, Shane? Yeah. Aloha, everybody. Ahui ho. Aloha. Till we meet again.